Hello there. I am so excited to welcome everyone to the first event in this year's Diverse Perspectives in Digital Media and Design 2022 Speaker Series. To paraphrase, bleh, to paraphrase James Baldwin, nothing can be changed until it is faced. And this is certainly true of the inequities that have historically shaped the indus entertainment industry as well as the museum industry. Uh, this is brought to you by UConn's Department of Digital Media and Design. We would like to begin today's event by acknowledging that the land on which we gather here in Storrs, Connecticut is the territory of the Mohegan, Manchatucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Scaticoke, Golden Hill Pagoset, Nipmuc, and Lenape peoples who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. We thank them for their strength and resilience in protecting this land and aspire to uphold our responsibilities according to their example. Today's event will feature a candid conversation with our special guest, Chris Cloud, followed by a Q&A featuring questions from the virtual audience. Please take advantage of the YouTube chat box to submit questions for Chris, which we will try to answer during the discussion. I'm Heather Elliott Famolaro, and I'm the department head for digital media and design at the University of Connecticut. Digital media and design is a young department which has rapidly grown to over 350 undergraduate and graduate students and 26 full-time faculty. We have seven undergraduate concentrations across the full digital media spectrum, film production, animation, interactivity, business, and the humanities at both the stores and Stanford campuses. And in our department, we value and celebrate our students' diverse backgrounds and we support their development both as individuals and as professional media creators. And this Diverse Perspectives in Digital Media and Design Speaker Series is one celebration of those shared values. Now on to the show. It is my extreme pleasure to welcome today's co-hosts, Professor Clarissa Seglio and DMD Digital Media and Design students, Raymond Oliver and Amir Migawin. Let me just switch to gallery view so we can see everyone. Uh, Clarissa Seglio is a U.S. cultural historian trained in the interdisciplinary field of American studies who works at the intersections of museum studies, public history, and digital humanities. Much of her research focuses on the roles that artifacts, material, visual, and digital, play in constructing national and social imaginaries within the context of museum work. Her book, A Cultural Arsenal for Democracy, The World War II Work of U.S. Museums, uh, by University of Massachusetts Press, coming out in 2022, traces how from the 1930s through to the immediate post-war years, the fledgling ideal of the museum as a social instrument active in current affairs led to new modes of storytelling <clears throat> through exhibition craft. Through her teaching and research, Seglio also collaborates with museums, libraries, and communities on interdisciplinary public-facing projects that engage diverse audiences and topics of contemporary concern. Welcome, Clarissa. Um, and I'm also happy to introduce our two student co-hosts, so <laughs> Raymond Ol Ol Olivier and Amir McGowan. Raymond Olivier is a creative experimentalist who strives to create artwork that incorporates multiple ideas into a singular cohesive experience. Combining graphic design, music, and video, he seeks to tell stories in visually and orally stimulating ways. Welcome, Raymond. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And then we've got Amir McGowan. She's a student strategist who values originality as an, and is extremely passionate about data analysis, marketing trends, and consumer behavior. She views herself as an investigator because of her knack of problem solving and loves taking on new challenges. So welcome, Amir. Hi, Heather. Thank you. You're welcome. And I am going to hand this over, and I'm going to be in the back behind the scenes. So take it away, Clarissa. Thanks so much, Heather. And I want to point out that Raymond and Amir are two members of our Digital Media and Design and Diverse Perspectives course that runs alongside this series. And our students are also in the audience tonight and have helped compose some of the questions that will be asked of Chris, along with those that you who are tuning in live post into the chat. I'm beyond delighted to have Chris Cloud as our guest today 
for our presentation in this white man's world, We the Ones Chosen on Working While Black in Cultural Spaces. Chris is the Director of Communications and Marketing at the Museum of Contemporary Art, San Diego in California, and has a passion for connecting people and ideas. Previously, he was the first marketing content director at the immersive art experience Meow Wolf in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and the social media and community manager at the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Outside of being the hype person for dope art institutions, Chris's words, not mine, but I love it. Chris is an artist and a culture maker himself. And I am actually going to be masking up and going back into the classroom to join the class. And at this point, I'm turning the proceedings over to Chris and to our co-hosts, Amir and Raymond. Thanks and enjoy everyone. Happy, happy to be here, everybody. I mean, I, I will just say real quick before we get started with the questions, the fact that there's like a digital media and design like department and that there's courses like this exist in the world right now are just like crazy to see. Like back when I was in college, I don't want to date myself, but it was like a good, you know, decades ago, they had digital art and that was about the extent of this and no digital marketing. So the fact that we have a, a creative uh, experimentalist and a strategist asking me questions today kind of blows my mind and I'm happy to be here. We're so happy to have you. Um, so the first question we have for you is just straight off the bat, the title of this conversation. Um, so you mentioned that the title of this conversation, which was taken from a Kanye lyric, um, could you just elaborate on that? Yeah, and, and I know that like Kanye is going through like a problematic time right now. And, and he did some problematic stuff in you know, the past couple of years, you know, visiting some people he probably shouldn't visit, rocking some hats he shouldn't, he shouldn't have rocked. But I still think that he's probably one of the greatest artists of our, of our lifetime in the 21st century. And so when I think about power, you know, for me, it was this moment of 2010 where I was starting to actually become like my true authentic self. I was able to sort of like break out of, of, of a mold of who I thought I was, just kind of how Kanye was also doing the same thing at the same time. And so, you know, going back to 2010, at the time I was working at an ad agency and I was actually doing IT work, right? So it was sort of like, you know, kind of not what I'm doing now. It was just, it was like seeing how advertising how advertising works, um, but from like the IT role of things. But at the same time, I will say the, the world was vastly changing during that, my time at that ad agency. You know, people were being laid off left and right because of the recession. Uh, you know, essentially, you know, like I was also thinking about what I wanted to do next. And this homie Gil, who's now an executive uh, creative director, he, he's a he's a, a Puerto Rican. He was sitting with me playing video games in the room that was like, yo, I was like, should I go to ad school? Should I make a book? And he was like, no, dog. Like, you should just go make stuff and go do your own thing. And so I think that's something that we see a lot, a lot of Black creatives and Black artists is that there's not paths for us in a lot of these industries and environments. And so I think we have to sort of blaze our own trails and do our own stuff. So like, I, I guess I felt that, you know, Kanye talks about power and going back to the title's talk, you know, I was in New York City uh, a, a week or two ago and I was getting like kind of like frustrated by just like, you know, I saw like Sadie Barnett show at the kitchen and I was thinking about like black art. I was thinking about this talk and I heard like this, I heard this track and or I had heard, I heard the lyric in this track and I was like, this is it, this is the title. Because like, I think about this, you know, like how is it that there's only a few of us black people in these spaces? Like, how is that possible? You know, that there's only like a, a few of us chosen to be here. And the thing about it is it's not easy to get into these roles. I mean, like a lot of, I don't, I'll, I'll be going to go off on a lot of tangents, so I apologize for today, but we look at, you know, job descriptions that were, that require five to seven years of experience or require a master's degree. And it's kind of like, some of us don't have that kind of stuff. So how are we going to get a, a spot at the table? So then I think about, well, if I, or even I'm not in a spot at some tables, but I think about stuff in the sense of, well, if I'm fortunate enough to be in these white cultural spaces, and I would say white cultural spaces, but I would say, white dominated cultural spaces, how did I, how did I end up in that space? You know, so in a way, I feel like I'm the one chosen, right, to sort of like represent like black voice and, the, and black people, which I would also say is somewhat challenging, right, because it's like, 
Black people are complex. Black history is complex. I can't represent my full race, but oftentimes like I'm in a room where I have to like represent black people as a whole. So like when I was thinking about this talk, I, and I thought about, you know, my experience, like being the only black guy in the room, but sometimes being the only black guy in the organization, you know? And so I think for me, you know, I had this really start making my own professional journey. And so in 2009, 2010, I started this thing called MPLS.TV, which is a, a way for me to like create my own title, which I really love that Raymond's calling himself a, a creative ex, uh, uh, experimentalist, you know, because I think we had to, we have, we have to do that. We have to own our own spaces. And so I was doing that myself and I made my own, I, with a collective of people, we made our own sort of like, you know, uh, media network, content network before content was a thing, before content creation was a thing that all brands are doing now, all people are doing now, we were seeing the future, you know? And so uh, I think from that experience from like 20, 2009 to like 2014, it really allowed me to sort of like see the void, right? So going back, uh, going back to what I was saying is I feel like around that time, media was shifting, like all weekly newspapers were dying. No one was doing video at all. So like, it's sort of like, I saw a void that was being, that needed to be filled. And it was like, oh, okay, let, let's actually start producing these videos. Let's actually start highlighting culture in Minneapolis that didn't need to be highlighted. And so, you know, I was doing, I guess in that time, I also started to like throw dance parties and made a pizza camp and just like started to consider myself as an artist. So I think it goes back to like being your, your true authentic self. And so when my contract ran out in, at, at the beginning of 2016, I was like, what am I doing next steps? Like, where do I want, where do I want my career to go at this point? Uh, the Walker Art Center had a position open that was a social media manager and community manager. And I was like, my, my cover letter for, for, for that role was literally, I was made for this position, let's talk. And they wanted to talk to me. And we, we had a few conversations. And after like a few weeks, I was joining the team on, on leap day of 20, 2016 to be uh, their social media and community manager. Yeah, thank you so much. That was very interesting. Um, hearing about how you know got to get to that point, I can definitely relate to some of the themes that Kanye expresses in power. Um, here we can see a picture of you actually in the Walker Art Center, and you know after you did all these projects, you found yourself embedded in a real within a real cultural institution. Can you tell us something about what that was like? Your experiences there? Yeah, for real. Uh, it, it was interesting. You know, the Walker at the time. There was a few black people. There was like a black HR person and a black curator, myself. I'm sure I'm missing a couple others. Maybe I'm not though. I don't think I am. So it was it was sort of like once again being in this like white dominated space, and then also trying to like you know push for change in a way and push because because I feel like I guess what I have seen myself become is sort of like a, a trailblazer and also like. I asked a lot of questions. I want to know why. I was like, but why are we doing this? Like, why aren't we doing more stuff on social? Why isn't this stuff being done? You know? And so like, you know, and, and I guess you, we can look back at the Walker and my experience and say, well, like, wow, you helped really tell the fact that it was multidisciplinary. Like you had a, a, a post that you did about uh, all genders welcome go viral and end up on Huffington Post. You know, like you grew the Instagram account to be more than 100K. Yeah, I did those things. But my my biggest like, uh, career moment from that time at the Walker and, and really in my almost in my career as a whole was talking to the producer of content there who does photo and video and I was like yeah you know I work with all these photographers I see it all come in but they're all you know a lot of them identify as white so like you know we have these jazz musicians coming through who are jazz greats amid Drake uh Wadita Leo Smith a couple other jazz greats and I was like you know, like, why don't we hire a black portrait photographer to take their portraits? One thing that the Walker does is that any, any artist that comes on site, they take their portraits for documentation for historical purposes. So I was just like, well, you know, like, and here's the deal. I don't know if y'all saw Super Bowl last night, but one of the best commercials was the Google Pixel 6 that was like, yo, brown people take photos differently. You know, like, it was like the realest commercial I had seen. And actually, I was like, should I get a Google Pixel 6? Like, I for a second there, I was like, okay, they're speaking to me, like, I, I know how it is like black people photograph different than like lighter skinned people, you know? So I was like, wow. Anyway, so I, I was like, if we're gonna shoot these black people, having a black photographer is gonna come in handy and be clutch for this moment. So I was like, yo, here's the deal. We just, we just talked to Bobby Rogers. He was a photographer in Minneapolis at the time. And I was like, we talked to him for around 
the end of 2017 to do a year end thing. So we already had a fresh relationship with them. I was like, Bobby's taking some of the best portraits in the city, if not the country right now. Can we, can we work with him? And Andy, to this point of being an ally, shout out to Andy. Uh, he was like, yeah, let's hire Bobby to shoot these portraits. And I was like, damn, I made some change at the Walker, you know? And that change rippled out there too, because uh, essentially uh, they were looking for a photographer. The photographer at the time recently, recently retired. And so they invited Bobby to interview for the photography job. And guess who got the job? Bobby. Like I replaced myself once. Like I was like, great. Like I was about to be out the door. I, I kind of knew that a little bit. And I was like, great. There's another brother coming in here to own space as a, as a black person. Uh, but now, you know, Bobby worked there for like a year or two. And now he's at Target uh, being a creative director. So if you go into Target this month and you see like black history displays, that's Bobby Rogers work. So like, you know, sometimes and it goes back to what I, I try to elaborate here is that as black people, we have to take care of each other to like offer space and opportunities that other people might not offer. We have to acknowledge that there's a lot of white privilege and white supremacy in these cultural spaces. And a lot of just like simple thinking to be like, oh, well, we have our diversity count. We have one or two people. Oh, well, like, you know, like Bobby is someone who doesn't necessarily have a resume full of professional photography, even though he's an artist making photography. Right. And so if he applied for that job without the opportunity, would he have gotten it? I don't know. Shout out to Bobby Rogers. Shout out to Emmett who hired him. But I don't know if that would have been the case. So I think that we have to keep acknowledging the fact that we have to create our own opportunities for each other and create sort of pathways for each other because ultimately we're going to take care of ourselves before anyone, anyone other does so yeah the way you talk about how um it's so important for black people to have a space in this community i think is very touching because you know if everything was created by like the white man or photography then everything would just be the same i think it's so important to have all those different perspectives and views because then it like opens so many doors um, so moving on to another question. Um, so you were leading the social media there when Philando Castile was killed less than 10 miles away. Um, so what was it like during that moment while you were working there? Yeah, I mean, real talk, it was probably one of the lowest times in my career, you know, just because it's like, dude was murdered, like by a cop. Like I had the knowledge that, right? The guy got off, off the hook, but that was a murder. Philando Castile was murdered, like Black Lives Matter. I mean, this comes after Michael Brown in 2014. And like, I'm like sitting there in the office that day, you know, they didn't, they didn't acknowledge it. They think they, they maybe, maybe sent an email out, but it wasn't, it wasn't to the level of what's going on now in cultural spaces. Right. So it's, I was just like, yo, are we going to post about this on social media? Like, well, I'll say, and I don't want to talk smack. I'm not trying to talk smack in this conversation. I know it's going to record it. I know it's going to be on YouTube forever, but I will say that a lot of cultural institutions herald black artists, but when black pain is present, they don't want to acknowledge that pain. They don't want to acknowledge that suffering and they don't want to acknowledge that Black Lives Matter. So it blows my mind that in 2017, that Flannel Cat, this is our work right here, what, what you're seeing on the screen right now is a picture, uh, a painting by Henry Taylor that was in the Whitney Biennial in 2017 uh, or maybe 2018 that was that he, he, he painted. And I, I saw this in person and it really stuck with me. So I, that's why I wanted to share this now it's also, you know, he's a black artist himself. And so that that's sort of why I wanted to show this. I know, sorry for the trigger warning that I should tell people there was this would have been shown. But I think we have to acknowledge that the fact that stuff like this happens every single day in America and that a place like the Walker Art Center just happened 10 miles away. This is the same road that I drove on as a college kid going back home. You know, like I, it could have been me. It could have been me. Like that's the thing that's crazy about this. You know, it could have been Raymond. It could have been all any of our friends or family, right? And so it's like the fact that like the 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 Walker at the time was like, oh, we don't want to ruffle feathers. We don't want to piss off donors. We don't want to like you know uh, get the board angry. We don't want to seem like we're taking a stance. I just think it's sort of like kind of blows my mind that obviously when George Floyd was murdered again in Minneapolis, uh, that then they were finally like, oh, Black Lives Matter. Well, then Black Lives Matter in 2017. You can herald the work of Carol Walker. And all these other black artists you have in your collection, Raven Pettibone, Lorna Simpson, Carrie Mae Weems. But when a black person gets killed with less than 10 miles of, of, of your institution, you can't acknowledge that. That's kind of whack, you know? And so like, I, I would say that going forward, it's something that I've considered ever since then is like, is this a safe space for me as a black person? 
am I going to be hurt as a black person? And I will also say too, that, you know, there's a lot of coach, which is, that goes on with like black people in, in white cultural spaces. Right. I mean, the way that I talk about things right now, which is, could be seen as uppity or could be seen as agitating. It's like, I reserve this from doing this in the workspace because I don't want to be seen as an angry black guy. I don't want to be labeled as like a stereotypical, well, that guy's just an angry black guy. We can't really, he's angry right now because a black guy got murdered. It's like, fuck yeah, excuse my language. It's like, heck yeah, I'm angry that a black guy got murdered, you know, 10 miles from our institution and y'all aren't going to say anything about it. And so, you know, I obviously was very top of mind in the passing of George Floyd and thinking about, you know, where I want to bring my work and where I want to feel safe. And so, you know, I, I think in a way, you know, how do we then, I don't have answers, but how do we create safe spaces for these sort of dialogues? How do we create, you know, like channels for people to express their frustration without being seen as a stereotypical black angry guy? You know, and the last thing I'll say in this situation here is that like, I've been, I've been very trepidatious about having a very candid conversation like this because, you know, my career is over with. I'm, I'm mid-career right now. Like I, I got a long ways to go. And I don't want to be uh, the Colin Kaepernick of the museum industry where I'm marked as unhirable because I stand up for my beliefs, you know, because that stuff still kind of happens where it's like, oh, we can hire Chris who's very talented and qualified, but he stands up for black lives. And he like had this talk once in 2022, you know, talking about how like white spaces are not safe, you know? And so, so for me, it's like at this moment, I don't really care anymore. I, I'm glad to be a, 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 a like, I'm glad that future employers can see this talk and see how I feel about this, because this is who I am. And do you think it's gotten better since then? Like, do you hope today maybe they would have reacted differently or, or not no, at all? No, I'm sorry, my bad. Um, no, I don't think it's better. I mean, I, I think that we see a lot of maybe improvements. I mean, slightly better from what happened with George Floyd, but why did it take George Floyd dying for those improvements to happen? And also, real talk about it, if we were in a global pandemic, and there was more distraction stuff going on with George Floyd had been a oh, um, um, Trayvon Martin. I mean, this is this has been going on for years and years and years. So like the fact that like it's just changing now, like several years later, it just kind of blows my mind. And yes, it's getting better. But like, you know, ultimately what's going to get better is when more black people occupy these white cultural spaces. And, and I, I think we're seeing that now where a lot of like museums are pushing for equity and diversity and inclusion and access, you know, so I think we're seeing more black leaders being leveled up and chosen, but like it shouldn't have to take black people dying for, for black leaders to be higher in those roles. I think that that was beautifully put, honestly. Um, I think now even having this conversation, We've heard news recently in Orange County, a police officer murdered an unarmed, an unarmed black man who was homeless, in fact. Um, we've had issues in Minneapolis where uh, no, walk, no knock search warrants going on. And even I like how you mentioned Colin Kaepernick. Um, the NFL, you know, has come under a lot of criticism for the way that they treat their black players. Uh, majority of the NFL is 70 percent African-American, but yet there are no head coaches and there are no owners that are actually black. And a lot of people are starting to compare the NFL to a plantation. And um, I, you know, like you said, not to trample on anybody's toes, integrity is really everything. And, and a, as a black speaker in a space like this, it can affect your career, you know, it can affect your career, you know, extremely. And I think that that's something that a lot of people are afraid to do is afraid to speak out. Um, whether they're black or any other marginalized group within a workplace, they are afraid to speak out. And I think the Black Lives Matter protest is kind of a prototype for other marginalized groups to get themselves together and be able to properly advocate for themselves. But I think that once again, your integrity is like extremely commendable because not a lot of people are able to do that. Um, but what's most impressive is that, you know, you mentioned that this was the lowest point in your life. You didn't feel comfortable at work. You didn't feel like they were acknowledging you. And after the uh, Walker Art Center, you eventually got to join Meow Wolf as your marketing content director. Could you tell us a little bit about your experiences there and uh, how it compares to your previous experiences? Yeah, I mean, Meow Wolf was interesting because it was, it was a shift, right, from a nonprofit institution that was like 75 plus years old to a company that was formed like maybe a year or two before I joined. It was an art collective like the nine years before that, right? So I think it was sort of like, they had this collective mentality that like we can change the world. And I believe in the product. I believe in the experience. I mean, what people don't know is, what people don't know is that Meow Wolf is this 
immersive experience where you can walk through a fridge, slide down a dryer. They have locations now in Santa Fe and Denver and Las Vegas. So I was coming out of a really formative time, you know, and I was like, the cool thing about it is that I got to work right away with a black guy named Austin Ross. And Austin was like, you know, I was like, great. Like there's, there's more like already, right. At the, the Walker, I was like the only black dude there after a while, if not, okay. Yeah. I think there was two or three black people and I was like the only black dude who identified as a male. Right. So I was like, oh man, Austin's here. And like, he's on my team kind of, and like, he's black, like, this is really great. You know, <clears throat> but I would say that transitioning down to like Santa Fe, New Mexico, which is like primarily like Latinx, Hispanic, white, and indigenous. Like it was also sort of a, a struggle for me in a way because like I didn't have like a black community in like Santa Fe. Additionally, there wasn't like my black culture. Like there was no fried chicken. I didn't have ribs there. It was like kind of like, okay, where do I find this? And like as a side note, I, I come to find out that when black people were migrating across the country, they stopped, they stopped in Mexico and there was like, there's nothing for us. They went to LA and Oakland. So like they just kind of passed it over. So that's why there wasn't there. But I would say going back to the actual work itself, it was really great to sort of like do creative work in a way for the whole half of companies that might have more resources. And quite frankly, it took way more stands for like things that they believed in. Like they didn't have the best tape or thinking about boards and donors that museums did, right? So I, I think that we were, you know, one of the posts that did really well for us when I, during my time there was for uh, National and International Trans Visibility Day, where we actually were like, let's talk about this. Let's acknowledge this sort of stuff. So I think I wish that more museums would take cues from places like Meow Wolf to sort of say, yo, we actually can like take hard stances on things. Like we actually can like, you know, there's a there's a there's a hashtag and a group of people out there that's called museums are not neutral. You know, and I think that's something that museums seem to recognize that they're not neutral spaces. And obviously, you know, we look at Clarissa, her history, we start to realize that like museums have never really been neutral. And that like, I think that we have to like, we we know that museums also serve different audiences and like the ones that they sort of cater to the most are primarily white donors who they don't want to, uh, uh, you know, uh, to ruffle feathers with. And so I think that, you know, I, I don't know what I'm getting at there. I think I'm just getting at the fact that like, when you work out for profit, you have way more opportunity to to sort of you know stand for what you believe in, and we see that a lot too with like what happened to George Floyd, right? All these brands start popping up, you know, and saying, "Oh, we believe this, we believe that," and that it would take museums, you know, sometimes twice as long to say the same damn thing. Yeah, and I can imagine that that was like a sigh of relief, where you could finally be in a space to be like free and have creative freedom, and you'd not be like afraid to speak on certain subjects and be surrounded by people of all different backgrounds. So I'm sure that was nice to move there. And that's kind of a segue into my next question, which is actually a question from our class. Um, so you have described yourself as a creative think doer. Um, what exactly does this entail and how might one achieve this status? That's a great question. I, I, I think I was inspired by in 2010, around the, my time of defining who I am. And like, I, I guess I'll, 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 I'll go back to that moment. You know, I've always had a passion for marketing and like for branding. And, you know, the advertising I was working for had a, a library. So I got to like read all these branding and advertising books that are like the 22 immutable laws of branding and all this sort of stuff. And then uh, shout out to Tim Brunel. Tim Brunel ran this program, which I thought was one of the most probably formative programs for me to like attend, which is called Conversations about the Future of Advertising. And so uh, Ferris Jakob uh, was giving a talk. He's like an ad sort of marketing specialist, branding specialist, strategist sort of person. And he, he, he used the term think doer. And I was like, whoa, that's exactly who I am. Like I'm a person who like thinks of a strategy, but then also can execute it. I think that if you look at traditional like advertising structures, there's usually a strategy team who like does research and thinks about stuff. And they have like the, the brief or like the big idea. And then they pass along to the creative people to actually design the ads and design the, the creative for it. But I think a creative think doer is someone who could do both. It's someone who can think of these ideas and then go out there and, and execute them. And I think it goes back to, you know, Raymond calling himself a creative uh, experimentalist. You know, I think it's very important for students right now, and, and quite frankly, even Blacks, to sort of uh, define who they are and define their own personal brands. So at the time, I was like, well, wow, like, no one's calling themselves a think doer. Like this is a word that like, if you put it in Google, nothing comes up. So I was like, I'm gonna own this space. I'm gonna call myself a think doer. And so I started to like follow a lot of like advertisers and strategist people on Twitter. That's like, I would say like one of the heydays of Twitter, 
was like back then because everyone was doing like follow Fridays and retreats. And so I was getting like some a lot of a lot of love back then. But I mean, I, I think it's sort of it's important to just acknowledge the fact that you can define yourself at, as who you are and then like do stuff that speaks to that. You know, so I was doing pizza camps. We had an idea. We did it. I was doing art. We had did our projects. We did them. You know, so I was actually being able to show people I, I was doing that. And ultimately, real talk, I mean, I'm, I'm talking to a lot of students, also some friends and family, shout out to my mom. You know, I, I think that it's very important to be able to, like, give yourself a narrative. So when you go into these spaces, you can say, well, I'm a creative experimentalist and here's why I do X, Y and Z. I'm a creative think doer and, I, and here's why I do X, Y and Z. So it's also something that, like, people should be thinking about, especially students. Uh, but ultimately, everyone should be thinking about their personal brands and how they want to craft their narratives and stories. Yeah, I think that's really inspiring. A lot of people um, are more of a thinker than a doer. And I think the fact that you're able to merge those ideas is really efficient. Um, and I think a lot of people can learn a lot from that, myself especially. Um, can you tell us a little bit what your experience has been like being the only black man in the room. How does your experience as an African American really shape your creative process and the execution of your ideas? These are two questions from our classmates. I just thought I would combine it into one yeah. just for yeah. just for you. These are good questions. You know, I, I think it's sort of like blackness has always been ever present for me in a way because like I grew up in like a white suburb. So like I was like already noticing the fact that like, oh, there's only like two other kids that look like me in, in kindergarten, like what's up with that? You know, and I also started to like, look at like popular culture, right? Like I used to watch a bunch of and I'm doing like that, like a bunch of different strats, uh, and like Family Matters and all this kind of TV shows. And I was like, I obviously identified with like Urkel as a kid. And I was walking around as a kid being like, can I do that? You know, because like, that was like, like black people. And I, I actually would say even as a side note, two, two couple of things, I'll go back to this question. But like we look at like the Fresh Prince of Bel Air, that was such a formative show for us because it showed that like black people can be successful. Like even with the Jeffersons too, is I feel like in 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 the time when I was growing up as a kid, it's like we you know I wasn't around when Sanford Sons was around or Good Times around, but there was like poor black people. They didn't want to show people like who are actually possessed of black people. So I think that's important. And and I think I I wanted to call out the Super Bowl yesterday because it's like, yo, why did it take so long if rap music's been around for what? 30 years now as one of the most popular genres in America. Why did it take 30 years to have a black rap like Super Bowl? It goes back to your saying earlier, Raymond, about like the NFL space is not being like black, you know, like there's black players, like there's black music. Like, like I said this before during the George Floyd stuff, but like white people love black culture, but they don't want to elevate black voices. And so, you know, I, I think going back to the question that was asked, you know, it's like, I try to always think of times where we can like, we can have more diverse representation. And like, I guess it's also sort of tricky sometimes because like, not only do I have to like answer the question as like Chris Cloud, the me, the person, but I'm also thinking about Chris Cloud, the black person, you know? And I also have to acknowledge the fact that of my gender, like there is like male people, male people do get more preference in some spaces, right? So I have to acknowledge that too. And then also, you know, all these, these different layers. And I think that's important because I think that no one person is one thing. We are all complex people. And I think that we, like, I wish that more spaces would acknowledge that and, like, hire more complex people. You know, I, I was watching, uh, <laughs> this is really funny, but I was watching, like, Next Level Top Chef or something. Like, I got into that so slightly. And I was watching uh, an indigenous cook, right, that was, like, making something that was speaking to her heritage. And she felt kind of shy about it. She was like, I don't know. I don't know if, I, if like, these people are going to accept me, this heritage. It's like, no. We should be coming with our full authentic selves into these spaces. I just think that sometimes black people don't want to bring their full authentic self for fear of all the things I mentioned, you know, of being seen like as uppity, by being seen, by being seen as like a rebel rouser, by see, by by being seen as someone who's like aggressive, you know, and it's like I'm passionate just like how you are passionate about things. It's just my, I might just come off of a little more aggressively because like I talk really fast and talk louder than some people. But is that, that that's more about this kind of a person versus this kind of a black man. Yeah, I think that's incredibly important to talk about. Like, um, of course, like white people don't have to worry about that when they're in the workplace. I think it's just like another thing on maybe like your agenda when you walk into the room, like, oh, I maybe I can't speak like that because they'll think this, ABC. Um, 
and it really just shouldn't be like that. And I hope one day that, you know, hopefully society will be able to unlearn that. Um, yeah. And so we'll move on to another topic now. Um, so in 2019, you said you took a trip to Chicago to see the late Virgil Abloh's figure of speech. Um, and this was a pivotal moment for your identity and how you define yourself. So could you tell us a little bit more about this? Yeah, I could, I could definitely touch on it. You know, I think that I'm, also, I'm, I'm this is his artwork from Figures of Speech. Um, it has a cotton symbol, a black baby, and then what are bullet markings, a very powerful work and an RIP Virgil Abloh. I mean, that was the thing that really kind of stuck out to me in that experience is that Virgil was anything he wanted to be. Like that was something that like I like got from the exhibition. I was like, do as an architect, do as a designer, do as a DJ, do as an artist. Like we're seeing what, 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 what I'm seeing now in the world is the collapsing of like having a one type of thing that you're doing, right? If this is 20 years ago, 20, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, it's like you are a painter, you are a marketer, you are a designer, you are a video maker, you are an illustrator. But now, since we have the means of production and like we're living in a world of content creation, people can be multifaceted things. People can wear multiple hats. And so I think by seeing the show, it allowed me to sort of understand that like, yo, I can be Chris Cloud the marketer, but at the same time, I can be Chris Cloud the DJ. I can be Chris Cloud the event producer. I can be Chris Cloud the creative think doer. I can be Chris Cloud, you know, the 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 professor. At the time, I was teaching myself um, in, at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. I was uh, teaching creating running a business. So all those sort of stuff were well, actually. I had left that job at the time, but I was I had a bad background in public uh, higher education. So I was like thinking about all these things and like I can wear all these hats. And so that this this sort of experience like really wooed me. And then I think if you go to the next picture, you know, I walk downstairs and like I see this room, uh, which is had this this piece of work in it, and it's like my favorite artwork of all time. Like I immediately cried when I saw this in person. And so what this is, it's a, it's a it's a shot of. Arthur Jaffa's Love is a Message and the Message is Death, which is like the preeminent work about the Black experience in America right now. It talks about Black joy, it talks about Black freedom, but also talks about Black pain and Black suffering in a way that is like juxtaposed. And what's great about this piece is that one, Arthur Jaffa is like, yo, we had a show at the Walker back in like 2018. And Arthur Jaffa is like, no, it's only shown in galleries. Like it's never gonna be shown on a big screen in a cinema. It's not meant for that, it's meant for art spaces. So being able to walk into the MCA and being able to like be confronted with this artwork, when, especially after seeing the Virgil Abloh show, which is about blackness, like, you know, like we don't want, he's a black artist, you know, I don't think we, you know, maybe he wasn't outwardly saying that and he doesn't want to acknowledge the fact that, you know, he, he says himself as a black artist, but like to me, that Virgil Abloh show was about the black experience. This is about music, it's about fashion. It's about that we can wear multiple hats. And so to be able to see that show and then be able to sort of like go downstairs and see the, uh, this artwork was so a, such a powerful moment. And so uh, you obviously can't hear the music, but the track that Arthur Jaffa uses is um, another Kanye West song, Ultra Light Beam, you know, which was a, it's a very like gospel -y type song. And like, this is everything, you know, like I, th th there's a line from that song, you know, where it's like, I, I, I felt like I almost feel like I felt the blackest in Arthur Jaffa's Love is a Message is a Message is Death, you know? And I think about this piece too, because within, you know, what, nine months later, George Floyd was murdered. And so having, be, being able to see this artwork in person and spend like, I probably watched it, it was like a seven minute song. I probably watched it maybe like three or four or five times. Like I just sat there and kept watching it and watching it. It was such a, a moving moment for me just as, a, a lover of art, but also a black person itself. And so like, if you ever get the chance to watch that in a gallery setting, like go see it, go, go experience it. Uh, just because I feel like seeing an artwork like that might, might change your life. Yeah, I think that was really, um, really beautifully put on um, the way that you talked about Virgil Abloh, um, especially because of the way he was a big influence to the African American community. Um, you know, originally he was a civil engineer who broke out into fashion. He was the first black man to have a major contract with Louis Vuitton, Hennessy Moe. I mean, the way that he worked in these spaces that have been predominantly white and European for literally over 300 years now, because these companies are so old, was groundbreaking. Um, he's known for his album work with um, Watch the Throne with Kanye West and Jay-Z was a Virgil Abloh production. 
And he's also worked on a lot of famous stuff, you know, along with his off-white brand. So he truly was a tour de force. Um, and of him, much like uh, works by Andy Warhol and other uh, artists, or even Basquiat, who's also a famous Black artist, oftentimes encapsulates the Black experience or the American experience in really creative ways. And that brings us to another question that we have. Um, how do you guys modernize the way in which you attract visitors? Oftentimes, art museums are seen as like, there's a big painting of some old person on the wall, but how do you, how are you revolutionizing the museum experience for uh, painters, I mean, for artists as a whole now? Yeah, 100%, you know, I, I think a lot of it goes into like programming and then social spaces, right? Like I just got sent a link out by a, a colleague that the, another great museum, which I love, which is the Smithsonian, the National African American History Museum, whew, I mean, I, I sort of, as a side note, this is like a little side note, I messed up when I usually try to experience museums from the top down, but I didn't realize that that museum starts from the bottom up. So I saw all these like black, like moments of like history of like that J. Dill's MPC and like Prince's stuff and like black scientists and like black, it was like all this black joy. And I was like, man, this museum's rocking it. And I go downstairs to the basement and I'm like, oh shit. Like this is where they talk about slavery and segregation. And, and it was a really, it was, I never got a chance of, I experienced on like a really fast loop. And so I say that to say is that that organization's hiring a digital curator. That's the way of the future where there's like actual like curators who are focused on digital spaces and digital content. So I think that social and digital, like editorial and social media are great spaces to leverage different voices and bring different people in. Because we, you know, in the museum world, exhibitions are like built out two, three, four, five years out. So you can't be as agile and as quick to be able to do things like that. Uh, another way I think that like, you know, museums and, and places can be more, you know, pushing different diverse perspectives and voices is through programs. You know, I think we see that with the, uh, with the pandemic, a lot of museums had the, the shift really fast, you know, to digital only programming. And I think it showed museums that like, you can do both. You can have both IRL programs and also in-person programs. So I'm starting to see that a little more of too, where like different museums are hiring like digital producers or people who like set up Zooms. And like, I'm just really excited for the future of museums because I think that, you know, there have been like some massive shifts in like the past four to five years. You know, the pandemic being one of them, George Floyd being murdered being one of them. Uh, you know, I think that the, 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 the financial, uh, not set that, the challenges or you know, things that will happen because of the pandemic, but also for the shift, you know, the museums for going forward. But so, yeah. Hey, Chris, mm -hmm. hey, Chris, hold on. Your, your speak, your, your microphone's going uh, Darth Vader on us. Oh, I'm sorry about that. There we go. I don't want to miss what you're saying. So if you can repeat that, sorry. Yeah, is it better now? Yes. Cool. Yeah, I mean, es essentially, I think that museums need to harness digital and social spaces more to use those spaces to like, be a little more relevant and, and be more active because that's where also the audiences are living, right? I think that for a long time, museums were thinking about, you know, a lot of it is a visitation in person, but I think now we have to think about website visitation and also what social media can do to engage with audiences. Yeah, personally, something I never really thought about about museums since the pandemic was how they were affected. Because when I think of museums, I think of like going, you know, it's like an experience where you're walking through it. Um, and then, of course, the pandemic completely changed that where I'd have to move online. Um, and I guess I have this question is, has it that affected it? And like, has it been difficult to attract like diverse audiences or new audiences? Or maybe the pandemic helped that and, you know, it's offering more people to visit it. Um, and what do you think speaks to people the most um, as a creative director? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say yes and no. I mean, I, I still think we have the, the question about access, right? Like. I think what the pandemic showed us was that like not every household has internet access. Not every access has like a means to connect to, to, to like the TV to internet or computers to internet. So I think that yes, there's programs that are digital first, but I don't know if that means that they're reaching, you know, full audiences. I do think it allows for museums to reach new audiences that maybe not have like maybe considered that or like there's an easier, I guess there's an easier, how do I say it? Uh, the barrier of entry is lower. I think when you think about going to a museum, as you were saying, right, it's like you get together, you go with your friends or you go by yourself, you you park, you walk through the door, you have to exchange a ticket, you go into the spaces. That sort of thing can be really overwhelming for visitors. 
So I think it allows museums like digitally to like be able to meet visitors where they're at and let them get comfortable with sort of the with with sort of the the programming or collections or artworks in a way that meets people where they're at and allows for people to kind of come into uh, the museum in that way. What was, your, what was your second question again? If you remember, I forgot. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. The second question was, what do you think speaks to people the most? And also, how did you know you wanted to work as the creative director? Good questions. Uh, one of them was, I mean, I, I think what resonates with people the most is authenticity. I mean, I, I saw that in my most successful post at the, at the Walker, in which, you know, the former president of the says, you know, was, you know, trying to ban trans bathrooms in North Carolina. And I was like, well, we have a bathroom sign that says all genders, you know, like, I'm going to use this space to say all genders are welcome. You know, that got 3,000 plus likes in a matter of a day. I think it might be one of those popular posts of the Walker of all time. You know, so I think that people want to see authentic spaces. They don't want to see what I don't, and what we'll talk about coming up here real quick is like performative actions. I think people can see right through that. So I think that what resonates with people the most is authenticity. And then uh, the creative director role, you know, I think it was a sort of like, I guess I've always been inspired by like advertising and ads, you know, back in college, I worked for the college newspaper and like before memes or like a name of a thing, I made a meme. I didn't even know it was a meme at the time. I, I took a piece of clip art, which is like a, old, a, a younger kid talking to an older person. And then I, I think I wrote like, who cares, grandma? You know, and then, then they, they put that in the paper. And I was like, what? Like, you? this is how like I could be creative. I could actually start making. I didn't consider myself an artist. I mean, even the real talk about it is that I call, I call myself an artist now. And I feel like I've been making art for years, but I don't know if I would have called myself that until like 2013, you know? So like even even for that I think it's, it's I think it's important to know that you might be a creative director right now when you have the you start calling yourself that own that sort of stuff and create your own path and, and create your own sort of thing. But I would say for me, it was, you know, around the time of, of, of MPLS.TV 2009, 2010, where I started to like realize that like, oh, there's these people at this advertising agency who call themselves creatives, but like they're making ads for like snowmobiles and like plumbing stuff. But I actually am, and like I'm actually just doing creative work. And like just making art, but I didn't really call myself that at the time. So that's very interesting because you mentioned a lot about how creatives will work for companies that are often um, don't make the best use of their talents. Or you know, like you mentioned snowmobiles right now, and you mentioned how your earlier works in a creative field was all about just content creation for the sake of content creation before it was really used as a marketing ploy. How would you say that it's unique from uh, marketing for a museum versus marketing as a business for as an experience? You know, what's the difference between those two uh, main segments? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, I think that like, I think about Meow Wolf and there's a lot of strong like content that is like advertorial in nature, right? We think about, we used to think about stuff all the time of like, cool, people are coming to Santa Fe, let's create an article about like the things they can do in Santa Fe so that when people ask that question on social media, you can link to our website. Also, you can visit our website. We're going to try to make the ads so it's all very strategic and nature. I think. Okay, hold on. Pause. It's doing the same thing again. Oh, I, don't, I don't know why. It's weird. Now it's good. It's like it's some point it picks it up. Sorry. Is it is it better now? I think it's better now. Speak again. Yeah, it might be. I I'm, I feel like my display is like coming in and out or something like that, but. So my, my, my bad everybody for watching that, but uh, going back to the question on hand, which was, you know, I think nonprofit and museums are, are mission based. And so I think that like everything should roll back up to the mission, you know, at the current place of that now, the Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego, you know, our mission has the fact that like art, the, you know, contemporary art is a prism. So I'm thinking about that all the time too. I would also say too, that museums are often sort of educational in, in nature, you know, like we're doing stuff for the purpose of like, educating our communities and our audiences. So I think that's a little different, right? Where like some businesses want to do that, but they're probably doing that in service of like, you bought our product and here's how you use it. Or like, we're gonna put out this like, kind of not clicky baby content, but content that drive visitation or like, well, I see that a lot for like social media companies like Buffer, Later, Hootsuite, Sprout Social. They have all these articles about like, here are the best 10 times to post on social media. Well, you post the articles, so you get like good Google rankings. So then people click that. So then like, Social media people like me evaluate their product. I think for us, you know, someone learns more at the end of the day. That 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 was our mission accomplished. You know, they they might think about the world differently because they read an interview with the artist that we have on on view. Yeah, I think that's what makes museums stand out so much is that 
they have the freedom and are kind of supposed to be authentic. I think that's what drives people to come. They don't have to, you know, force people to view it a certain way. It's all open for interpretation. So I think that's great that, you know, you have so much creative freedom in that position. Um, so moving on, you started your current position at the MCA San Diego in 2020. Um, could you just talk a little bit about your experience there? Yeah, it, it's been really good, you know. So essentially, you know, I, I joined the team as a, a communications and marketing director. Obviously, this was in a time of a pandemic. So this is me back in like November 2020. So it was, it's, I will say in general, it's a very weird thing starting a job like remotely. I was at, remotely at the time in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And so like not being embedded in the community was like somewhat challenging for me. But, you know, I think the museum has given me a great opportunity. Like, for example, I was able to be a part of last year, the McKenzie's Black Leadership Academy. So it was like their management accelerator. So I got to level up my, my skills and, and have the space to do that. So I, I'm thankful that the museum was able to do that. But, you know, I look at like the first person who I met at the museum was a black security guard. And that's like the only other black person yeah, the only other black person that we that is on the staff of like 2025. So like it was really cool that I I got to see her first and talk to her first, right? Because you know there's this thing that we call code switching, which is like how you talk about stuff in a boardroom or with a board, and how you talk like with another black person. So immediately I was able to like code switch right away and understand like the real talk vibes of what's going on. You know, I would say that you know San Diego has a black community, but not to the scale of other major places. So that was also sort of a challenging for me because I feel like I'm black here and there's like the most black people I feel like you know, it's on par of Minneapolis about numbers of black people I see places, but I don't feel like this is a black city, you know? And, and then I will also say too, if we look at uh, slide number 10, you know, one thing I was evaluating in this moment post George Floyd was sort of like, how are, are the places I work for, you know, elevating black people, elevating black voices. I mean, that was like, I think I applied for the job two months after George Floyd was murdered, you know? And so like the first thing I kind of did was like look at their social media to sort of wonder like, what are they doing about black voices, you know? So it's like, you know, I, I see this here and it's like, oh man, I'm like, we're committed to learning and, and acting anti-racist practices and we're committed to amplifying black voices and business and communities, you know? And I get into the actual space and like, are they doing that? You know, I'm not gonna talk smack about my current employer, but like the jury's still out for me is all I'm going to say about that. And could this be seen as performative? Possibly. And that's all I'm going to say about that. So it's like, you know, that's something that I'm more mindful of as I progress my career is like, yo, you can post all you want, but until you actually do the work, then that's like, that's what really resonates with me. It actually shows it to me that you are amplifying black voices and businesses and communities. And it's not just when a black person gets murdered, you know? And so like, that's just something that I, 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 I like to think about in this moment right now is like, am I going to go to a, if I, do I want to be in a space that actually does the work? And it's, here's the deal. It's hard work. It's hard work. It's not easy. It's not easy acknowledging the fact that like white supremacy is deeply embedded, embedded in these institutions. It's not easy to try to like make for more black voices or BIPOC voices on boards. Those people don't want more BIPOC voices on their boards. Same thing Raymond was saying before, right? I mean, the NFL is a, a, a white man's club, essentially, and they don't want to let Black people in the spaces because they then have to be confronted with white supremacy. And that's a heavy thing for most people to actually acknowledge. And so I think sort of like the tension exists of like acknowledging white supremacy, but then, but then, but then not doing enough to actually show up for Black communities or even Black workers. I mean, real talk, I don't want to get into it, but like, I know that there's a white male director getting paid more than I am. And how does that make me feel as a black person? Not good. Yeah, um, I think that's a really great uh, segue, you know, into the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, without getting you into too much trouble, because I know you're still employed by them. And I don't I don't want you to, you know, step on any toes here that might uh, hinder your success. Um, how do you know when it's performative activism versus actually caring? Where do you know that the line is just for like, okay, we're just trying to look good because this is the time where everybody else is doing it versus we legitimately care? How does your job show or once again, fail to show that they actually do care about black lives? That's a, that's a great question, Raymond. You know, I think it starts everywhere. Put it in the job description. 
make sure that the hiring process, the, 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 the processes are accessible, you know, do some things like you say, like I said, I was saying before, people might not have, okay, how do I say this? I think we're increasingly seeing that people have nutritional paths going forward for employment. People might take gap years or might start their own projects, start their own businesses. So this idea of like having five to seven years of core experience or having a master's degree is blocking possible talent. So I think part of it begins in the hiring process. Part of it is like making sure there's black leaders. I mean, the real talk about it is now and like it is what it is, but like the leadership at the place I work for are all white presenting. Like there's not one BIPOC on, on that leadership team right now. And like, that's a problem because if you're thinking about like how ideas as a priority, then it, yeah, you can say it's a priority, but when you actually, until you make it a priority and actually create budgets for it, to create space for it, to create, to actually come out in staff meetings and say, idea is important to us and here's what we're doing. Transparency is key. You know, I think a lot of times the stuff kind of like gets dropped or, you know, what happens to it, you know, I, I didn't join the idea committee at Meow Wolf. Cause I was like, you know what, at this point, like real talk, like I was the highest black person at the company, you know, and I was a director level. So I was like, well, I'm, I feel like I'm already doing a lot of the work. I'm already championing a lot, a lot, a lot of the spaces. So like, I didn't want to basically sort of like, uh, you know, do double labor because the real talk about it is that a lot of idea work for a lot of Brown BIPOC people is like emotional labor. It's hard. It's exhausting, right. To be like, okay, well, here's what you have to do now, like X, Y, and Z, like I should have to do that. And so I, I think it's important that there's allies in these white, in, in these white, you know, dominated cultural spaces and that they should also be carrying some of the work and carrying some of the workload, you know? So I, I just think that's also very important to know too, is that like, if, if, it's a, if it's a real priority for people, people will show up and do the work. And if it's not, then you know, then you know it's not a priority. Yeah, I think that's so eye-opening that, you know, obviously companies and businesses can post all they want about, um, you know, activism and say that they're for this, but then on the inside, they could just not be doing anything for their Black workers whatsoever. Um, and I think a lot of the time, you know, like you were saying, if every single person in charge is a white person, they don't have that experience where, you know, they have faced discrimination. So that's not obviously going to be on their minds all the time. So that's why it's so important to have you know, black people on top and to have power because, you know, you need those people telling them like, you, hey, you got to open your eyes. We have to prioritize these people too. Um, so thank you for saying that. Um, so our last question, because we are running out of time, is what is next for you, Chris Cloud? Yeah, uh, you know, in, in, this, in, 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 the, in the next month, this is very tough. Uh, next month, I'm going to take my talents to Chicago and join the MCA Chicago, Museum of Art Chicago. I feel it's gonna give me the best opportunity to, to sort of hold space and to create work and magic. Uh, and not only just to sort of, uh, you know, create work and collaboration uh, through that, but I, I wanna be able to feel like I, I, want, I wanna win there. And, and I feel like I can compete up there. By the way, I, I paraphrase that by the announcement that LeBron James gave on the decision, but the real talk about it is, yeah, like, this is, this is like the first time I'm publicly saying this, pending a background check, but like I'm joining this museum next month. And uh, that's this is a picture I took uh, in 2007 from my Flickr account uh, from my first experience there. And I, 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 when I think about some of the best museum shows I've seen, uh, Kara James uh, Marshall Mastery, Figures of Speech, uh, Murakami, and just like what they're doing next with Nick Cave coming up uh, in, in May and then Martin Sims, who's a, a Black femme artist from uh, Los Angeles, like they're doing the work, at least, at least as far as I can tell. I know that all museums are problematic and that white supremacy is a, a structure that needs to be dismantled over time. So I know there's still going to be some roadblocks along the way, but I'm super excited to, to go to, you know, a black city and to have like, the, like my boss is going to be, is a BIPOC, the deputy director is a black femme. Like I never have seen that in my career working in cultural institutions. So I'm super excited to, to sort of go up there and join the team next month. Well, congratulations. We know you're gonna be so successful. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for talking to us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Bye, bye everybody. Getting unmuted here. Let me put this back on gallery so we can see everybody. Um, this conversation has been so incredible, Chris, and thank you, Emer and Raymond. I mean, 
you know, just the, the, the way that, that I'm rethinking visiting museums and the role and my commitment and our commitment as a department to, you know, getting voices out there in the world. It's just been incredibly insightful and I'm really grateful for everybody's uh, involvement and your engagement students and, and uh, for your moderation. Thank you so much. Um, I do want to share our next uh, event, which is next uh, in two weeks, Monday the 28th at five o'clock when we will be having a talk called Taking Flight with Ricardo Dominguez. Um, in this talk, Ricardo Dominguez will focus on three lines of flight he has created, um, the history of electronic civil disobedience, flight facilitation, gestures for immigrants and refugees, and speculative dronology. So again, five o'clock, same time, same place. You can sign up to um, share that conversation with Ricardo Dominguez, who's also in San Diego, Chris, actually. Um, and I also encourage you to check out the entire rich lineup in our Diverse Perspectives in Digital Media and Design 2022 speaker series. Uh, go to dmd.ucon.edu slash diverse and do not forget to subscribe to us here on YouTube because you will be able to get notifications uh, about uh, all of our department's great content. Um, and thanks to all of the organizers and the wizards behind the scene who work together to produce such a great uh, and insightful show. Uh, and thanks again for all of the virtual audience members out there that we're here to watch. We have had already 37 playbacks, so it's pretty great feedback um, from all around uh, the country. And I hope all of you out there are as inspired about the future of digital media and the museums. Uh, as we are in this uh, this Zoom room here today, um, there's obviously a lot of work to be done, as Chris has pointed out, and we all know. But you know, we need to work together and, and make the change happen. And if we continue, you guys here, Raymond, Emer, and everybody in the classroom, you all are the future of this because we're going to keep empowering you and giving you the space to make the change. And hopefully, the museum experience is going to be a completely different world for your grandchildren, my grandchildren, my children everyone else. So anyway, thanks again to everybody. Stay safe. Have a wonderful week. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Black History Month. And uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Bye-bye, everybody.